and refresh this again. There you see just one blue rectangle. So I'm sorry for the confusion on that. If you guys go back and take a look at this demo code, go ahead and copy and paste that into WebMatrix yourself, and you'll get a clean, crisp example um, that makes a little bit more sense. But just a couple of quick things to point out here. Remember that the ID used in the get element by ID method has to be the same as the HTML method that you're referring, or sorry, the HTML element that you're referring to. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about transmitting data. Um, using a web browser is is really interesting, um, and, and creating creating robust interactive applications requires the ability that that we so the ability to send and receive data. For this to happen, we have to be able to communicate with servers when we're on our phones and on our, our PCs and laptops and all those other great devices that we use, right? Um, note that, that a, a user's computer, our computers, are commonly called clients, right? Um, we're able to, to send data back and forth with servers because of things like JavaScript, right? They make the creation of, of all of our programs possible and the ability to send and receive data possible, right? So here, you've got a computer sending data to a server and then of course a server sending data back. Um, to further facilitate this, we can use the XML HTTP request API, right? Um, it uses JavaScript to pass data in the form of text strings between a client and a server. And one thing I wanna point out now is that HTML is made of text strings, right? All of our tags, all of our keywords, um, they're all text strings, right? And so um, the XML HTTP request API um, actually just goes ahead and sends the, those tags back and forth, right? Um, we've got some, some basic syntax here for the load function to the right, and I want you guys to note the following here, right? So we, we go ahead and, and we create a new XML HTTP request object stored in XHR, right, which is short for XML HTTP request. And then the, the open method here is going to specify the HTTP method for contacting the server, right? So we use get. It's also going to provide the web address as well for that server, okay? Then when, when we, we call the callback, function here, um, we're going to get a response from the server. So we get that response, and then finally, um, we're going to go ahead and, and use the send method in order to send data to the server, right? So um, that's it in action. When we do receive data back from a server, we have to, to parse which components are going to be used. And so we send all kinds of complex information back and forth. Um, and, and parsing is the ability to analyze that complex information and break it down into its smaller parts. So um, with JavaScript, you have a number of options for parsing data um, so that we can get usernames, um, access photos associated with those usernames, um, also get, get phone numbers, addresses, all that good stuff that we use the web for, right? Get directions, cool stuff like that. With JavaScript, we, we typically are gonna find ourselves using JavaScript object notation um, f to, to do some of our parsing. And so um, it's called JSON, right? Um, it's a subset of, of JavaScript that, that you, is used to exchange JavaScript objects with a server. And there are two APIs within JSON, right? You've got the dot parse and dot stringify APIs. Um, when data is received from a server, the dot parse API is used to just go ahead and, and you know, do the parsing and actually read through the data and break it down into its smaller component parts. And then when the data is sent by a client, the stringify API is used to turn that data into strings so that it can be sent. Next, we'll talk about uh, loading and saving files. So um, how do we handle data locally, right? Uh, JavaScript is wonderful because it actually helps us validate, uh, sorry, let me take a step back. JavaScript allows us to load and save files from our local computer, like I had just mentioned. Um, sometimes you're going to ask a user to upload a specific 
type of file. Like maybe I want to go ahead and upload a picture of, there's my dog again, $500 an hour dog model, Stella. Um, but, but what might happen is that a user might go ahead and try to upload a .doc file. Right? We don't want that to happen, and so we can use JavaScript to tell our users that, hey, you're uploading the wrong file. You definitely should upload a JPEG. Um, do that instead. Right? All right. Um, another really important aspect of JavaScript that you need to understand is, is app cache for offline files. If we want users to be able to access our, our web pages or our web apps when they're offline, we're probably going to want to implement app cache. Okay? App cache allows us to, to store data locally when users are offline. And it, it's going to store resources like you know, the HTML files, CSS files, and JavaScript locally on a user's machines. And so that's what allows them uh, the ability that's what allows them the ability to, to access those, those files um, <laughs> when they're offline. Sorry, guys. I'm getting a little tired today, if you can't tell. Um, and, and finally, the, the cache manifest file within the, the app cache uh, API, the application cache API, is going to dictate which type of information is stored offline. Um, that cache manifest file is really just, um, it's a file that includes a, a list of all of the different files that are supposed to be stored when a user goes offline. So um, everything that's in that manifest is going to go ahead and, and just stay right on your computer after you lose internet connectivity. All right, lastly, we already talked about this with validating form input. And uh, you know, a lot of this can already be done on the client side with CSS and HTML. Um, but JavaScript can, can also be used to validate user input. And so sometimes you know, you're going to maybe forget the at symbol in an email address um, or forget to write .com. And so JavaScript is used to perform client side validation uh, in addition to CSS3. Rather, you can use it in lieu of. So maybe we type Jane at live and forget the .com or .org or .net, and then uh, JavaScript can prompt us to provide a valid email address. It's pretty cool stuff. Oh, and one last thing: cookies. And I'm not talking about the kind that you bake. All right, um, cookies are small text files that websites save on your computer. Get rid of that second that there. Um, they contain information about you and your preferences. And with JavaScript, you can store and retrieve information from cookies. Um, you know, cookies, as we mentioned before in, uh, in module one, they, they can, can cause some problems for people um, from a security standpoint. Um, they also can cause some slowdown in terms of, of rendering and viewing content because cookies are actually stored on a server. And so every time that, that you, you request a website um, or access to a page, that cookie may be sent back from the server. So then the browser can use that information to, to render a page with user information um, or, or maybe even help generate ads that are, that are more specific to you and your interests, if you guys are ever, ever curious about that. Um, but people are starting to move away from, developers are starting to move away from the use of cookies um, in, in favor of something like app cache and also um, local storage and session storage, which, which will store your files and information. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, that's it for this presentation. This is a pretty quick one. Um, 4.3, we coded animations by using JavaScript. Talked about how, how you would do that, the different types of animations you could create, and also about how you can manipulate a canvas element. Um, we also went ahead and talked about how you can access data using JavaScript. Um, transmitting data, loading and saving files, validating form input, and also cookies. Um, thanks again for joining me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'll see you guys again in Module 10, okay? Hi, I'm Cullen, and welcome back to HTML5 Application Development Fundamentals. We're going to get started with Module 10, our final module. So uh, without further ado, let's start talking about coding for the touch interface. 
Um, today we're going to talk about how to respond to the touch interface, uh, just touch interfaces in general will be detailed. Uh, we're also going to touch on objective 4.6 coding additional HTML5 APIs. Uh, we've got four that we're gonna, gonna talk about, geolocation, web workers, web sockets, and the file API. And we're also gonna touch on web storage again, um, local storage, and then also session storage, okay? All right, guys, let's get going. Uh, touch interfaces. So most of you are familiar by now with what a touch interface is, right? They're, they're featured on tablets, on smartphones. Um, all that they are are screens that are developed specifically for sensing touch. There are a couple of different types uh, available, right? Um, processors treat touches like mouse gestures, and then they relay all that information to an operating system and then ultimately to an application, right? So when you touch a screen, that gets turned into data, and that data gets transferred and relayed to an application, which then responds to that touch. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that process here today. All right, so finger moves are called gestures. So if I take this finger and I move it, oh, whoops, my apologies, guys. Let me bring on my marker. If I take this finger and I swipe to the right, that's a gesture, right? But gestures can also include presses, taps, and slides, all sorts of things, okay? Um, how an application responds to a touch or a tap is called a touch event. And we can use JavaScript, including uh, three different methods, touch start, touch end, and touch move, to create these touch events. Here's some common touch gestures. Um, you've got tap, which is essentially the equivalent of a left click with a mouse. Double tap, which is a, a left double click. Press and hold, which is similar to a, a right click in order to bring up options on the screen. You got uh, selection or drag. It's the same thing as being able to drag a file across the screen with a mouse. Um, and then, of course, zoom, right? Um, zoom with the mouse, you, you hold control and then scroll your mouse wheel forward or backwards. Um, with, with touch, we actually are going to pinch an object inwards or we're going to go ahead and, and spread it outwards. Pretty simple stuff. Here are some common touch gestures, um, just a couple of different visuals, right? We've got tap, which is just a single tap, double taps a double tap. Drag, just moving, sliding to the left or the right. Um, pressing and holding is gonna replicate that right click and then zooming like we just talked about on screen. Oops. Um, so when, when you make a gesture, you, you want your application to respond, right? In order to get that to happen, we use the add event listener method to attach an event handler to an HTML element. So if I press a, a button, I'm gonna use the add event listener along with a, a touch event uh, to go ahead and, and start a function that I've, I've coded. And, and this is the general syntax below here, right? We have our, our touch event, then we have our, our function, And my writing is atrocious today, so I'll apologize for that. And then finally, we're going to use uh, the keyword false. Uh, I could discuss at length why false is there, but this is honestly something that is best if you take the time to look up, because it's a little difficult to understand, and there's definitely some reading that needs to be done. So do a quick Bing search for, um, I guess you could say, add event listener syntax, and then add the keyword touch, and then go ahead and hit enter. You'll find some really great information on this syntax and the general format to use when adding event listeners, okay? All right, let's keep on going. Um, a gesture event is very similar to a touch event, um, except a gesture event's a little bit different in that it's when